Ladies, thank you so much for tuning in to Uncommon Women. Uh, so today we actually have a guest speaker. I'm super excited about the guest speaker that we have. Uh, we're going to be speaking on depression and suicidal thoughts. Um, I am aware that this is actually a you know, sentimental topic to discuss, but I believe that it's very important to discuss uh, so she will tell her story today in regards to how she um, experienced depression and then she's going to go into how she was able to get treatment and then where she is today. Um, I also will include in the bio um, some resources for you to seek any help or any treatment that you may need if you're experiencing um, any any anything that she's went through or or if you know anyone that's going through uh, depression and have suicidal thoughts, uh, please try to get them some help. So, Shanina, tell us a little bit about your story. I want to thank Uncommon Women for sharing your platform with me and um, offering the opportunity to share my story in hopes to help um, women just like me. Um, so my name is Shanina Diana. I am a visual and performance artist based in Pennsylvania, uh, living in Coltsville uh, and working primarily out of Philadelphia, the West Philadelphia area. Um, a bit about my testimony. I, so my, my work serves as a platform uh, to help raise mental health awareness. It's been doing that for the last seven years now um, via my annual art exhibition uh, entitled Embryo. So this year, this past March, which is my birth month, um, I presented every year in March and, um, you know, as a testament to what I've, you know, to lessons learned prior to my next birthday, uh, I credit this exhibition and, and my works, my creative works to have literally help save my life. And with this exhibition, I provide safe spaces for uh, my audience to come and, uh, you know, help relieve the stigma off of uh, what it means to discuss mental health, especially in our black and brown communities. Um, I did not grow up knowing that I was depressed. I did not grow up knowing anything about depression or suicide or borderline personality disorder or uh, trichotillomania, any of those things. But those were all um, those were all things that I was dealing with. And it wasn't until my late twenties that I um, that 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 there were names put to it. Um, so my childhood, growing up, I had two parents. I had my mom and my father. They were both Navy, um, Navy workers. Uh, both met in Hawaii, had my brother and I there. And we traveled often in my childhood up until about middle school or elementary school, rather. Um, and they divorced early. Uh, I, I think, I guess around when I was six or seven, they got a divorce. And so it was a lot of back and forth between my father and my mother um, in the summertime uh, between Jacksonville, Florida and Coltsville, Pennsylvania. And, um, you know, I, I was just that girl who made friends easily because of my upbringing, you know, having to adapt to new environments often. So I made friends fairly easy, uh, fairly easily with, you know, my brother and I uh, did that very well. Um, we got along with everyone. And um, but I still, you know, I got teased and I got bullied. And um, I remember one time in uh, in middle school living in Florida, uh I'm pretty sure it was a truth or dare situation because this young lady comes up to me and she punches me in my face just out of nowhere, right? And I'm I'm walking through the halls with my books clasped to my chest and, uh, you know, she comes up, she, she does the thing, she punches me in the face. I'm pretty sure I saw stars <laughs> and, um, you know, the friends who were with her started laughing as if they knew it was coming uh, and I was so stunned. 
I just, you know, I just went to class and kind of just <laughs> kind of try to figure out what the heck just happened. <laughs> and um, that was one of the very first times I started to receive that kind of um, bullying in school. And um, I went and told the uh, hall monitor and he made me go to her class and I was so scared. <laughs> and uh, he made her apologize to me. And I said, oh, great. Well, this is definitely going to be not working my favor <laughs> uh, after school. But she never bothered me again. Um, there was once that a young white girl, she spat at me and she called me a nigger. And, you know, that's when I'm mad, impressionable. You know, we just learned about Dr. King and Malcolm X and you know, Rosa Parks and the whole civil rights movement. And I'm like, I'm sure this is not supposed to be happening in early 2000. You know what I mean? So I, the first thing I thought to do was retaliate. You know, I throw rocks at her home and uh, my mom learns about it when she gets home from work and she let me have it, you know, as if I was in the wrong. But that was one of the very first moments where I had to learn that, uh, you know, you can't fight fire with fire. And um, you have to, um, you know, it's compassion always, right? Because how people respond to you is really a, a reflection of how of who they are and what they're truly, you know, dealing with. What's deeply rooted within them. Um, so I've all, so I've grown, I've grown up knowing to love, love true, love whole, and love always, no matter what, no matter what someone brings to you or. or or tries to destroy you with, you just love on them. Um, and, and not that I'm not at fault sometimes, you know what I mean? I can, I can be, I can be a mess, you know, and respond unhealthily, but, um, that was embedded me, embedded in me very early. And I'm very thankful for that, uh, for that lesson. I didn't get it at first. I was looking at my mother like, what lady, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but, um, for the greater good, that's for sure. So not too soon after that, I um I learned I learned very early on that I had a knack for literary um, and visual arts. Um, I always, if I didn't excel in anything else in school, in grade school, up through high school, through college, um, I knew that I was going to I could bank on getting good marks and receiving good grades for my my writing skills and for uh, my visual art skills. So. Um, I remember in third grade, I uh, had to write a short story. I forget what it was about and what the concept even was, but I had a whole storyline and I had pictures and drawings and all of that. And um, apparently I did so well that my teacher, Miss Powers, she uh, made it a point to share my work with the whole third grade class, basically. And I remember feeling very proud at nine years old, you know, um, being acknowledged for something that came from me, came, came out of me and, uh, you know, and, and was received in a positive light. It was beautiful. Um, and for me that, that meant a lot because, uh, I didn't know at the time, but I was secretly dealing with some issues with some mental issues, but you know, nine years old, you don't think about that. You just go outside and you play and you keep it moving. (laughs) Um, but I didn't, I do remember how that made me feel being recognized for, um, my skill for writing and, and drawing and painting. So um, I would immerse myself in those uh, in those classes and that in those fields in school and I always excelled. Um, and then I started to get into dance. I started to get on drill teams, step teams, uh, you know dance squads, anything that would uh, permit me to move um, that was, that was my, you know, my innocent ecstasy, if you will. It provided another opportunity for me to just express myself and, you know, not be judged by it. And, um, it was freeing and it's still freeing to this day. Uh, movement is incredibly healing. Um, and is a, is a very, um, pivotal part, um, in my healing process. And, uh, so yeah, I've always made it a, po- a point to stay active, to stay move me, uh, to stay move, to stay moving, <laughs> and to um, and to keep creating. So in, in whatever way that I could create, I was going to do that. Um, and uh, so I, I mean, 
at nine years old also. So I started my my lady friend, right? My menstrual cycle at a very young age. I developed at a very young age. And so that came with, um, you know, the attraction from older men. And I didn't know, I didn't realize how detrimental that was for my mental state. But it's just, I just knew it was always something that I had to deal with at the time. And so here I am, nine years old, I'm developed. You know, I remember one time I was, um, playing double dutch with my friends outside of our home in Jacksonville, Florida. And, you know, I'm getting it in, I'm jumping rope, I'm having a good time. And the young lady behind me, she stopped turning. And um, she said, Shanina, or maybe she called me Nina. She said, Nina, you're bleeding. And I was like, no, I'm not. You know, and I run into the house. I change my overalls. I try to clean up as best I can with all this toilet paper. <laughs> and I change everything. Um, and I come back out. And I was like, oh, it's just ketchup. You know, and I didn't realize it back then. But, you know, in retrospect, I um, the fact that I felt the need to lie, you know, and cover up what was naturally happening to my body or maybe unnaturally but you know what I mean um (laughs) it was I was ashamed and I was I was mad and secure about it um and I just knew it it made me feel uncomfortable to have to say oh I'm dealing with this this womanly thing while my eight and nine year old peers are looking at me crazy because I'm bleeding from my rear end you know (laughs) it it wasn't it wasn't fun um, and, you know, and also, uh, like, as I mentioned before, my, my parents divorced early and, um, transparently that came with, uh, you know, exposure to domestic violence and abuse and verbal abuse and, um, you know, just unhealthy communication and, um, uh, ineffective communication. And so, um, you know, I learned early on what it looked like to not um, have a healthy relationship with, you know, with a partner, with a, with a spouse, with a, with a boyfriend, with a girlfriend, whatever the case was. Um, And so that affected who I, the kind of partner I was Um, in my teens, you know, leading up to adulthood. I, uh, I think I always knew that I didn't want to be that, I didn't want to be, I didn't want to be my parents, okay, I I wanted to be better, right, so that meant overdoing it, overcompensating, over, you know, catering, and being mad loyal, and, you know, doing, just doing all of the things that I'm pretty sure I should have just been cultivating and giving to myself, but again, I didn't, I didn't know what that looked like, I didn't know what self-love looked like, I didn't know, um, you know, what queendom <laughs> looks like, and, you know, today, man, I, it's a beautiful time, you know, as far as uh, uh, owning your blackness, or owning your curves, and your stretch marks, and your, and your insecurities, and your quirks, and all. It's, you know, because back then, man, it was just not a thing, and, <laughs> or not that I was exposed to, um, and, uh, you know, I, I became an unhealthy partner. I was I was the best partner, but I was unhealthy as well because all of what I did to um, cultivate love in my partner, I was depriving it of myself. You know, de- you know, depriving myself of that, and then I in turn became an unhealthy partner. Right? Like I didn't know how to respond to certain um, issues that would come up. Um, all I knew was to love, love, love love on them, make sure they were pleased, make sure they were good. But, you know, if I'm deprived, if I'm stripped, if I'm if I'm empty, I don't have any more of that to give. So when issues arise, I'm like, I, I'm, I'm coming from an unhealthy place. I'm coming from what I know, right? I'm coming from what I was exposed to. Um, and that played a, um, that was hard on me mentally because I am such a pleaser and I, you know, I desire everyone around me to be so full of love, right? And, and you know, offer safe spaces, you know what I mean? And, and be at peace 
and tranquil, you know, and have a sound mind and, and experience that in abundance when you're around me. And so when that doesn't happen, my world is just all over the place. It's, it's upside down. I'm frustrated. I'm probably angry, you know, and none of that, none of that communicates well um, verbally. So I think that's one of the reasons why I resort to painting, right, or dancing, um, or maybe even singing. A lot of people don't know, but I am a very um, huge fan of opera and classical music. So, uh, you know, sometimes I will belt out some operatic notes, <laughs> or I will, you know, just flow uh in any in any creative direction that I could possibly fathom in the moment to uh just kind of um resist the urge to be this unhealthy version of myself because again I'm like I, I you know I don't desire to be that person. Um you know in high school a lot of I always got Shanina do you ever have a bad day? You know, you're always smiling. Do you ever curse? And uh, I still to this day get that question, but um, I'm a, I'm a little more open and transparent about, yeah, man, I do, you know, <laughs> I I let cats have it, you know, sometimes, and um, or myself most times, you know, I always resort to self harm when, um, or I, I would I would always resort to self harm or self. Um, you know, just verbally abusing myself or bullying myself out of certain opportunities or whatever the case may be. Um, but thankfully, prayerfully and thankfully, I am, I have grown. I, I, I am yet evolving. I don't present myself with all of the answers, right? Um, and I, and I find peace in that, you know, I find peace in knowing that I'm still growing and learning with my peers and with the people who even look up to me. I'm learning even from them. And I love that. I love that part of this journey that I'm on um, and being able to share that and pay it for what I do know. Um, and, and, and that is art. Art is, has the ability to heal, has the ability to help transform um, mindsets and offer just unique opportunities for people to be brave and courageous and uh you know meet arrive at some some kind of transcendent resolve concerning themselves um that's what art has always been for me this is my line right i i share this all the time but art is my brave side it has granted the courage to express visually what I would not otherwise have the courage to express verbally. And I, I'll i probably use that <laughs> use that line until the day that I die. I, uh, It's so true. It's so true. And, and um, you know, today I now, you know, help run a nonprofit youth arts program called Art Buds, um, catering to youth 8 to 13 years old in the West Philadelphia, in the West Philadelphia area. Uh, at, at the Urban Art Gallery um, on South 52nd Street, and you know, you know, it it, it started. It was birthed out of a need um, because I learned that the inner city's public schools uh, in in Philadelphia were pulling the arts and culture classes from the curriculum, and you know, naturally, I'm thinking, you know, you're you're pulling away the the very thing that may actually help. Or work, if you will, work to help affect real change in the lives of our youth. Um, you want to write them off. You want to sus- expel them or suspend them so far be- um, behind on their work that they don't have enough time to catch up. Or you want to write them off for ADHD and, and you know, put medicine down their throats. I mean, and I'm not taking away from um, the wisdom that goes behind some of those decisions, but a lot of times it's, it's a lazy effort in helping a young child. And, you know, that's, that's my perspective. And I, you know, I'm so hell bent on art can help (laughs) art save lives. 
it helps save mine, you know, it ha- it's helping to save the lives of the youth that I'm teaching right now, and even some of the adults that come to my exhibitions year after year, it helps, you know, a lot of times art, visual and performing arts is the only scapegoat that a lot of people have, it's the only safe place that a lot of people have, it's the only you know, unique opportunity for people to say, hey, I'm here, I have something to say, will you listen this way? We've simply lost too many um, young men and women uh, to suicide, and, and it's just not, it's not just, you know, young men and women, but my heart, I have a heart of servitude for our youth, and it pains me uh, greatly to learn that you know, a lot of times these these young people just do not they don't they don't feel like they have another way out. Um, and I get it. I identify with it because I was there. And, um, you know, it just my platform, my position right now is. Listen, it shouldn't be taboo. It should not be taboo uh, or or. It, it shouldn't be taboo to speak up about what you are dealing with mentally, what you are burdened with neurologically, psychologically. I, for a very long time, thought it was just me. I thought I was alone. And my, I thought it was my normal, right, to fantasize about death, to, to think that, oh, you know, I know that, you know, my family is going through this or they're going through that and my friends are dealing with this or they're dealing with that. And, um, you know, and I was always that girl, that friend, that sister, that cousin, whatever, who uh, would, I would, I would take their problems on and I would, I would comfort them. I would be a shoulder. I would be an ear to hear, you know, I would be whatever. And I, I took pride in that because I have a servitude a heart for servitude uh, for the people, for the especially the people that I love. But you know, when it was time for me to uh, share what whatever I was dealing with um, secretly, I always would bully myself out of the opportunity to say, "Hey, I'm dealing with this because I already knew. Oh, she has that load, or oh, they're dealing with this stress, you know, financial stress, or you know, marital stress, or you know." I will always say, "Oh, they're going through their own thing." So my my logic, right, was. Oh, well, if I'm not here, then it will be a little bit easier on the people that I love. Like, that's such a distorted um, view of of my life. That was, I, that was so unhealthy. And for, I am so thankful that I had art to help nip that in the bud for me. You know, to give me a purpose, give me another reason to be here, give me... Um, you know, another space to, to say, to be present, right. And to speak up and to communicate in another way. Um, I'm truly thankful for that, you know, and again, you know, thinking that I was alone all of this time, it took for me to get on nationally syndicated television, right. To expose my truth to the world. Um, only to learn that, oh, they're, you know, learn after, thereafter, oh, Shanina, on your mother's side, your great grandma or your great aunt uh, dealt with bipolar dis- disorder. Oh, Shanina, on your, on your father's side, the matriarchs of your family that you, tr- that you esteem highly, even still to this day, some of the strongest women I've ever met in my life, they've dealt with suicide at some point, depression at some point. You know what I mean? And but no one spoke up about it. I didn't grow up learning. I didn't learn anything about BPD and and depression and and suicide or any of that until my late twenties. So you have to think, not from as far back as I'll say seven, eight, nine years old, up until now, until up until maybe just a few years ago. That I was void. Right, I was deprived of that opportunity to learn that I wasn't alone, and I, <laughs> and so now I'm in a position to change that narrative, right? Because unfortunately, some young men and women are not here because of that very fact. Right, because of the taboo, the stigma, the the this this 
this um this myth <laughs> over what it means to talk about what you're dealing with emotionally, spiritually, physically, mentally. I am not a doctor, right? I'm not um you know, I'm not a physician. I'm not a I'm not even a um, legal therapist, if you will, but I am an artist who has a heart for the people who have dealt with specifically suicide, um, borderline personality disorder, major depression. And if I'm in a position to help um, relieve that stigma in the least, in the least, some minute change, anything, then I'm going to do that. Right, because and the best way that I know how to do that is through the visual and performing arts. As I grow and continue to build and, and cultivate beautiful um, um, relationships with the likes of the Department of Behavioral Health and Intellectual Disability Services um, here in Philadelphia, I I will do that. I will do whatever I can to help relieve this stigma. Um, I trust that that's my purpose. And I am truly, truly, truly grateful for it. Um, I want to thank you, Shanira, so much for sharing your platform with me, um, for, you know, granting this beautiful opportunity to pay it forward. Um, And, you know, as an uncommon woman, I am, this is, I can't even fathom, I I cannot put it into words how grateful I am. And, and, And I'm proud of you. I'm very proud of the woman you've become and this beautiful platform that you've created for women like me um thank you for being an uncommon woman and i look forward to reconnecting with you very soon (laughs) love and lights peace and love thank you so much for your wonderful uh story and your testimony of how everything played in your life shanina so that i did have some questions in regards to um your story uh how long was you feeling depressed or what was you thinking about as you, you know, smiled for the public and was hurting in the inside? This is my very first podcast, Aww. so uh, I look forward to seeing how this goes. Um, but to, to answer your question, how long did I know I was depressed? Well, for a very long time, I didn't know anything about depression. I didn't grow up learning what depression was, what suicide was, what what you know, borderline personality disorder was, and those were all things that I was diagnosed with um, later in my in my twenties. Um, but it's, I didn't realize yeah, until my twenties that I was depressed. So if you had to ask me how long did I know I was depressed, I don't, I can, I can't answer that because mm-hmm. I, I, I didn't know where it started, <laughs> when it started. Um, but and what, and what was the second part of that question? Uh, how, cause I know you, we went to school together. So like, sure <laughs> as you could smile for the public, but was hurting in the inside, how did you get to that part where you realized like, wow, I'm, I'm really diagnosed with depression. Yeah. Uh, well, so to your point, we did go to high school together and I did smile a lot and I did go home hurting and I, but I didn't know what that meant. I just knew that that was my norm. Um, I knew that I didn't want to be a burden on mm-hmm. my friends, on my peers, on anyone who was around me. I just wanted, I wanted them, I wanted whoever was around me to experience uh, something contrary to what I was dealing with, you know, personally, you know, behind closed doors. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, you know, I was always that friend who people will come to with their, with their issues. And I, and I loved it. You know, I loved being able to help cause I'm a, I'm a, you know, I have a spirit, a strong spirit of servitude. So if I could help in any way, that's my bread and butter, right? Like that's, mm-hmm. that keeps me going. That's my life. I love it. And so when my friends would come with their issues and I, you know, I'm very loyal and trustworthy and, you know, all of that, I will be whatever you need me to be as your friend. But when it was time for me to pour out into someone, I will always bully myself out of doing that because I was like, oh, I know you have your issues and oh, you're going through this and I know you're going through that and you have financial struggles. So it's like I didn't want to add on to what mm-hmm. I knew what everybody else was dealing with. Um, so I would I would harbor it. I would keep it to myself. And um, at the time, I didn't know. It, I did not know it was unhealthy, but I would I would resort to self harm. Then I would I would trickle is one of the uh, the habits that uh, 
or something that I've dealt with since I was before adolescence, actually, since I was about nine, because um, mm-hmm. I developed early and um, I would pull hair from my body, um, namely the pelvic area. Uh, I would just pull, pull, pull. And uh, it was like a, a it was like this painful experience, but also um, uh, euphoric at mm-hmm. the same time. It was, you know, it felt, it was like a good pain. Mm-hmm. And it was like just enough for me to just take my mind off of whatever it was that I was dealing with. And then, you know, and at times it would be hours that I was doing this to the point where oh, I was wow. getting carpal tonal, carpal tonal in my hands, you know, on my wrists. Mm-hmm. And I would look down and I would be completely bald, like completely, you know, smooth baby patches in wow. certain areas. And um, it wasn't until later, like after, after high school, and I was still doing it in my early 20s. And I was looking, you know, I would do it and I would be there for hours and I would get the pain in my wrists and I I would say this can't be healthy this is not this doesn't this can't be a good thing because mm-hmm. <laughs> um, you know going into womanhood tw- after 21 you're just like there's certain things certain habits that just yes. should not be in play <laughs> you know while you're trying to live your best life uh-huh. and achieve your goals um but so yeah the, to answer your question that's I I didn't know I didn't know for a very long time until my uh until my late 20, early to mid 20s that there was a problem and then it wasn't until my late 20s that I said okay I need help so wow yeah. wow that's good so what was your family saying when you know they found out all these diagnoses and experiences that you've been going through this whole time all right so <laughs> um so to, what is it? Two years ago now. Mm-hmm. Two years ago, I uh, was on my first ever nationally syndicated. Had my first ever nationally syndicated uh, interview with Mike Jarek on Fox Twenty Nine, um, the Good Day Show, and he re-interviewed me again as a follow-up interview this year. Um, for my embryo art exhibition that I have every year. We'll talk about that later. But Mm -hmm. the very first time um, he interviewed me, it was the first time I had openly, publicly exposed my battle with depression, um, borderline personality disorder, and suicidal thoughts with a plan. Mm -hmm. Um, I shared it on that uh, television show and my grandparents saw it my parents saw mm-hmm. it all of my parents have my you know my step parents mm-hmm. and my biological parents my family you know everyone saw it right so that happens and then after that happens mind you Shanira I had been dealing with this since nine years old and that's just as far back as I can personally mm-hmm. remember um, and I thought it was it was just me, you know. I thought I was alone all this time. So I get on the show, and then after I get on the show, I learned, oh, you know, it's right in my bloodline. You know, <laughs> oh everyone out of the woodworks, <laughs> everyone out of the woodworks, the matriarchs of my family, who are some of the strongest women I've ever met in my wow. life, and I will ever know. Um, I learned that they too dealt with depression or bipolar mm-hmm. disorder on both sides of my family wow. and you know and these are some, I'm, I'm talking about even my I love her I love her to life my mom bible toting lady ever since mm-hmm. she came out the womb in my eyes you know what I mean she's mm-hmm. the strongest lady ever and uh but I, I learned that she too has suicidal thoughts at one point you know that my aunts who are also some of the strongest women that I know they dealt with depression at some point um on my mother's side my great aunt uh, I think my mother said that she uh, was diagnosed with bipolar disorder I was diagnosed with by um uh, borderline personality disorder but still it was a mental neurological psychological disorder of some kind that I had to learn about after I exposed myself <laughs> on nationally syndicated television mm-hmm. and all of these years I thought it was just me mm-hmm. and I you know and as at one point so to answer your question about their response to their response was oh we dealt with this too but it was just never said (laughs) Mm -hmm. and uh and that's you know and that's 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 you know that's what motivates me now to uh continue to expose the diet and expose the the dialogue concerning mental health you know encourage the dialogue concerning mental health and get people talking because i could i could easily not be here Mm -hmm. you know what i mean from nine to 29 years old i could easily not be here to talk to you to share my testimony to share these embryo exhibitions every year i could easily not be here um 
you know, just off of a simple conversation that I think that will help bridge the gap between, you know, generations. You know, if I, if I could have had this conversation with my mom five years ago, even, I mean, what, you know, what great difference it, would, it may have made, you know, in my life. And I, I granted, I understand that things happen for a reason and everything is in divine timing. But, you know, with there, there are a lot of young people, young and old, but there are youth, there are a lot of youth who are not here because they didn't have that safe space that said, hey, I can talk about the fact mm-hmm. that I'm hurting mentally or I'm dealing with fantasizing about killing myself. That, that was me. I would fantasize about... You know, how I was going to do it, where I was going to go, how I was going to, you know, write the letter and all of that. I was I was fantasize about that because I legitimately thought that me not being here would be easier on on everyone around me. And I laugh, but I, I laugh to keep from crying because mm-hmm. that that's not something that a, uh, you know, a 12 year old, mm-hmm. nine year old, 21 year old young girl should have to think about. Or you know, or or a young man, she has to think about. Period. That's just. Yeah, I think being, you know, being African American, I think we do lack communication in our families, and oh, absolutely, I, I think it's it's lacking, and it with the lack of not communicating and telling them your experience as you were growing older we we come into uh situations where we're in high school where we feel as though we're alone and Mm -hmm. we don't know why we're going through this when it's generation curses that hasn't been broken or brought up yeah we have to relieve that stigma we have to and so you know i'm not a doctor i'm not a you know i'm not one of those but i'm an artist and i so i use it's 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 in incredibly important for me to use my platform to continue to serve as a platform to help raise mental health awareness. It has to happen. Um, it's, I credit art to literally help save my life. And if that means I can, you know, pay it forward and help someone else stay here and, and keep, keep going, then that's what I'm going to do. Um, because I didn't have that, obviously. I didn't have um, a safe space growing up to say, hey, I think about killing myself from time to time. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Like, I didn't have that, that safe space. And not that I didn't have loving parents who tried their best or a loving grandma or loving aunts or loving brother and sister. It's not, you know, a lot of times it has nothing to do with that How you were per se. It's, right. it's, it's, it's with... Internal. Um, yeah, it's it's in, it's internal, and it has a lot to do with how we uh, how we communicate with each other. You know what I mean? How, seeing, actually seeing each other, as opposed to passive regret. You know, just passively going about our days. I mean, we're not. If we talk about social media, you know, societal status quo. We, I mean, we can just tap on something, drag it away, and mm-hmm. put our phone to the side, and we can just keep on going. But with in reality, human interaction, that's a whole different, right. I mean, anymore these days, it's scary to look someone in their eyes and, you know, and communicate with them and interact with them and actually see them and feel them and, and exchange vibrations Emotions, and energy right. and all of that. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's, you know, that's my whole goal moving forward, creating safe spaces and continuing to encourage the dialogue uh, to talk about mental health for sure. Now, was you ever admitted in the hospital? And, you know, if so, did you sit there thinking like, wow, how, how did mm-hmm. I get here? So, I uh, yes, I decided um, back in 2015, I believe, uh, that I needed help. So I, um, well, okay, so I went to a routine visit uh, for, with my gynecologist. And um, I was, at that time... Because uh, it, it comes in waves, the depression, the suicidal mm-hmm. thoughts, all that. It comes in waves. So during that particular time, when it was time for me to go see her, um, I, w- I was I had just probably that earlier that week dealing with depression, suicidal thoughts, that kind of thing. So when I got there, she had never asked me anything about have you been depressed, have you been experiencing suicide, none of that ever. Mm-hmm. But that particular visit. After she checked me up and all of that, she asked me that question. And she's been dealing with me since I was, like, 15. Mm-hmm. So I was like, I was like, lady, wait. Now, is this <laughs> something you don't know? I got scared. Cause I, and I started, to, I started to tell her no and let the routine visit be just that, another mm-hmm. routine visit. But something in me, some, you know, that, that 
that gut feeling mm-hmm. for me to just speak up because I didn't, like I said, I didn't have that safe space to talk to anyone else. And nobody ever before her asked me, are you depressed? Mm-hmm. You know? So I, um, I said, well, well, wow. Well, yeah, I guess I have been, you know, dealing with this, dealing with that. I just kind of ran it down to her mm-hmm. and I just, I kind of kept going because I, no one's ever asked it's me. It's your that, first so time to talk like, about it. Yeah. yeah so I just, <laughs> it just poured out of me. Right. Aww. And this is my gynecologist. Right. So she, uh, so at the end of all of that, she recommended a therapist. So, um, not too soon afterwards, I uh, or not too late afterwards, I went to go see my first ever therapist, and she wanted to know my backstory. So she really, I mean, the questions that she were asking deep. was, <laughs> she dug, she dug deep. I mean, some things that I didn't even, I forgot about that I put, you know, suppressed so far back in my mind. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's another thing that I do that I've always said. I always, you know, uh, the unhealthy events in my life, I will always suppress them and put them in little pockets, you know, mm-hmm. deep into the and deep into the you know in my brain um but she forced me to kind of pull them up and and relive them and i was just okay so i guess this did happen and between you know the relationship with my father and the relationship with my mother and seeing them with you know domestic violence and abuse Mm -hmm. and verbal abuse and all i mean all of it came up and uh and then again, I got into suicidal thoughts, fantasizing about death, how I would do it. And uh, she basically, at the end of it all, said, um, I think you need to be admitted to a behavioral hospital. And I, and that was my very first time. You know, I was in shock. It was my mm-hmm. very first time to talk to a therapist <laughs> about all of this. And and, and now you want to admit me? I'm like, wait, <laughs> right. Now, wait, just pump your brakes for two seconds. I called my stepmom and I'm like, Dude, she wants to admit me. You know, she wants to put me into a hospital what do I do what do I say she was like well I don't think you need to do all that and, you know she had that, that she was like, I don't think you need all that you just went to go talk to her and I was like yeah I know but again something told me you, you got to do this you got to mm-hmm. because you already know that you're unhealthy you know this there's something ain't right so I said okay so I self-admitted. I was supposed to be 201 um, self-admitted into the Belmont Behavioral Hospital. Um, they told me that they didn't have any more beds in the 201 sector of the hospital. So I was actually 302, which oh, is involuntarily wow. yes. um, admitted, which was with the, you know, the homicidal patients, mm-hmm. the patients who actually look, quote, unquote, crazy. Yeah. Yeah. And, um... And I was scared. I did not feel like I belonged. I cried. I was admitted at one o'clock in the morning via ambulance by oh. myself. You know, they, they, um, they took my shoestrings. You know what I mean? They took mm-hmm. anything from me that would, um, permit harm. Mm-hmm. Anything that I could possibly do harm to myself with, they took it from me. And I was, I was freaking out. I'm not going to lie. My, both of my roommates were, uh, one was an addict, a drug, uh, a former drug addict, and the other was, uh, she looked normal. She was a Latino young girl, um, but she, she, she was very um, vocal about her issues. Like she, mm-hmm. she was the one acting out the most in the, in the hospital, and um, it, it, was, it was wild. It was a wild ride. It was cold. I was scared. I was like, I don't belong here. I don't belong here. But then um, I went to one of those meetings, you know, that we have uh, the next day. Mm-hmm. And it was like, it was like therapeutic Jenga or something. And um, I said, I, it humbled me. It mm-hmm. humbled me to be able to have a conversation with that, that big black man who had big bug eyes and was had drool coming out of his mouth. And he had very crooked, missing teeth, spread out teeth. And wow. he was a big guy, too. And, they, you know, if before that, not that I was a judgmental before, but mm-hmm. if I were to see him on the street, I'd probably, you know, go, go to the, the other way. side. Yeah. If I was, you know, if I was, you know, walking alone. But in that, in that hospital, we were it, it humanized it humanized what it meant to deal with a mental health issue or disorder. Um, it, may, it humanized him for me. You know, we're humans at the end of the day. I am just like him. How dare I say I, I don't belong here? This is not where I'm supposed to be. I identified with every single person that was there. And, you know, and this is someone who looked 
quote unquote normal, you mm-hmm. know, but that there's, there's no, mental health issues, mental disorders, psychological disorders. It, it, it's no respect of a person. It could really, it could plague anyone. Um, I remember, and to that point, I remember seeing a poster while I was admitted and, uh, it said it well there was a it was an old white couple with a you know with the house on the hill white picket fence there was like a black athlete there was these korean asian uh family young people old people everybody smiling everybody looking like they have it all together so there was a question in the middle of the poster that said which one of these people is dealing with depression and then in fine print at the bottom it said the answer is all of them. Every mm. last one of them had dealt with some kind, some form of depression. And I said, wow, okay, that that further humbled me and encouraged me to get the most out of my experience there um, at the Belmont Behavioral Health Hospital. I was only there for, admitted for 72 hours. I was ready to go. I'm not going to lie. I, <laughs> I, could, I um, And thankfully, my parents and my um my my very good friend uh, came to visit me every single day um, mm-hmm. to, I mean, my parents came from Coatesville and, and Belmont is in Philly. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and my friend, my good friend, he uh, lived in West Philly. So he came and they supported me every That's single awesome. day that I was there. Um, and upon my release, I actually uh, left with my good friend. And, um, and, and that was that experience. And I remember being released and walking out of those doors and seeing everything completely different. I mean, I mean, we got on the bus, which I really loved. I loved that we got on the bus and I was able to see other, you know, see the people, you know, the, mm-hmm. it's just the people doing on their daily travels, going to work, doing whatever. And I'm looking at everybody like seeing them, you mm-hmm. know, like new lens, actually, like a new lens. Yeah. Like, you know, like with fresh eyes, like, you know, even secretly praying for them, you know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. something, it was just, it was, it was very, um, life affirming that experience for me. And, um, so even though the first night I was like, Oh, I don't belong here. I cried myself to sleep. It was very needful. Um, and it only, uh, made the work that I do now that much more, um, effective because I was able to, um, have that experience, be humbled, be broken, be humbled and, and, be almost reborn Mm -hmm. um so yeah i'm very thankful for that now when you were discharged from the hospital did you attempt any more suicide um activities or engages or do you feel it was like a complete transition in your life so I am yet in, in transition. Um, I have not acted out praise, praise the good creator above. Yes. Um, I have not, um, I have not pursued any, um, suicidal harm to myself. The thoughts come and go, like I said, they come in waves. Um, but I've learned to, um, I've learned to, um, let the thoughts be what they are Mm -hmm. because you can't, I I don't deny them. I don't deny the thoughts that come, but I do, I have learned to prevail over them and have control and take control over them and not let them take control over me. So, um, and, and so it is with my art and with, you know, with dancing and writing or whatever it is that I choose to do creatively. That's also something that aids in my, in my combat, you know, Mm -hmm. against suicidal thoughts and attempts. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. So if you could give any advice for teens or women uh, that's going through or possibly have thoughts like you have in the past, what would you, what would it be? Man, it is, I, I think at this point, because I'm yet in transition and I, I don't come prepared, you know, I don't, I don't present myself with all the answers, you know, mm-hmm. um, but I will say this, it's very simple. Um Effective communication goes a very, very long way. Um, I understand the importance of safe spaces. And if that means you have to create it for yourself, then do that. Um, along this journey, I've learned that accountability goes a very long way <laughs> as well. So I can I can, I can, can say that, oh, you know, my parents were divorced and, oh, I, I experienced, you know, domestic violence and abuse and, and, you know, between my parents. I could blame it on that at 30 years old, right? I could, mm-hmm. I could keep saying that, or I could, um, hold myself accountable mm-hmm. at this point and take control and, and say, Hey, I can be better than this. You know, I can, I, this doesn't have to win. This is, this isn't my lot in life. And I say that a lot to young girls, this isn't your lot in life because I've been there. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, effective communication, 
goes a very long way. Um, immersing themselves in something that they love. For me, it's art. Um, and letting that kind of not only take their mind off of it, but help them kind of uh, explore and, and really because face, you know, face what, what it is that they're going through and that. So it, it offers them an opportunity not, to not be in denial because being in denial is unhealthy. Mm-hmm. Um, that was something that I did for a very long time too. But painting, you know, the self-portraits of myself really helped me, you know, see myself and, and it also provided an opportunity for me to see myself in a different light. You know, I didn't have to paint me slitting my wrist or paint me hanging from a ceiling. I painted myself holding flowers or, you know, I painted myself dancing or, or doing something of strength, mm-hmm. you know, um, and integrity. So, um, yeah, I would, I would encourage young girls to, you know, speak up, speak up, speak up. Effective communication will go a long, very long way. Um, it, it, it will, and I promise it will. So how has your life changed since you had that interview on in the news and um, now that you're actually painting and doing the things that you enjoy doing? Yeah. Uh, how, how has it changed? I mean, <laughs> um, you know, gosh, Shanira, I don't like the name drop, but I, <laughs> I have, I have, I, <laughs> I've, um, I've garnered some very, very beautiful uh, relationships with some very powerful people. Mm. And um, I guess namely the, the Department of Behavioral Health mm-hmm. um, and Intellectual Disability, Disability Services in Philly. Um, they have been incredibly supportive of the embryo exhibition um, series. They are on board to continue to support me <laughs> um, moving forward as this annual exhibition happens every March. And I'm very thankful for that, to have them backing me. They they want to work with me to try to facilitate something that will help the Philadelphia area um, as That's far awesome. as merging the arts and the you know mental health sectors. And I, I mean, I mean, it's it's beyond me, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like it's it's, it's 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 awesome. I'm you know I'm so grateful, and it's you know it's like little old me, you know what I mean? It's, <laughs> it's, 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 I I I honestly, I, it's really it's really hard for me to fathom and to put into words how I how I feel, but that's, that, that's the cut. That's where I am right now. I'm mm-hmm. guarding really beautiful relationships with some very beautiful, powerful people who can really help affect real change um, in the lives of our communities. And I'm very, I'm so thankful for that because it could be, it could be another way. It could easily be another way. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that's, that's awesome. where I am. That's awesome. Thank you. So you have your own website is it that you have for painting what is it that you exactly do that they're yes. assisting you with yeah oh well so it's this so my website it will be upcoming this september prayerfully the new website will be up okay. um but they are supporting embryo so embryo is this annual art testimonial that i have every year in march march is my birth month mm-hmm. and um so i like to share lessons learned prior to my next birthday through this exhibition um and I do it through the visual and performance art, so large, large scale tapestry paintings, um, usually of sub porches of you know of me, um, and they're backing that. They're backing the opportunity. Like this year, um, uh, this past March, uh, the Department of Behavioral Health provided free mental health screenings um, at my exhibition. I posed a question last last I think last fall, um, you know because I've been doing it for seven years now, how will uh, the embryo exhibition, how can it, how can I make it more effective? How can mm-hmm. it be more beneficial to the people who come year after year after year? It's a free exhibition as it is, um, but how could it be more effective, mm-hmm. especially regarding mental health? And uh, a lot of people are like, well, where can we go to get help? You know, mm-hmm. a lot of people can't afford it or they don't know where to go uh, and provide resources. So, uh, the, uh, the Department of Behavioral Health um, provided free mental health screenings. They provided uh, resources as well for, you know, pamphlets, information, that kind of thing for people to seek further help if they needed it. Uh, the mental health screenings, nobody was uh, diagnosed. <laughs> no one was like, diagnosed at the exhibition, but they were um, informed about where they stood mm-hmm. um, as far as their mental state was concerned. And then they, they were uh, thereafter provided resources to seek help um you know to other um 
mental health facilities, institutions, that kind of thing. So um, that's that's basically my relationship and their backing behind my, my annual art exhibition um, every year. And that's something that people could look forward to moving forward um, from my exhibitions is, is uh, you know, that support from the Department of Behavioral Health in Philly. That's great. That's great. And ladies, I'll definitely, you know, keep you up on everything. I'm going to have her uh, Instagram page in the bio so that you can uh, be able to uh, communicate and see what the dates are for the oncoming month of March and also her um, information for her link for her exhibit as well. So without further ado, um, Shanina, what makes you uncommon? <laughs> What makes me uncommon? Oh, I think the best way to answer that question is exposing my truths. I, I expose my um, my flaws. I expose my 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 hard, deep rooted truth for the sake of helping someone else um, heal and um, ex- experience and explore a more transcend a transcendent resolve concerning themselves. Um, Art is my brave side. It always has been, and it, it's been. Um, it's granted me the opportunity to uh, express visually what I wouldn't otherwise have the courage to express verbally. So, um, I think that's what makes me uncommon. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much again for you know coming out today and giving Uncommon Women the opportunity to hear your story and to be able to help those in need or anyone that's been experiencing depression and suicidal thoughts. Um, I greatly appreciate um, your wonderful story and this moment that we're able to engage and uh, give you and also a platform and opportunity to help others. Thank you so much for having me, Shanira. This is, I truly appreciate this opportunity. (laughs) It's an honor. It's an honor. So, ladies, be sure to tune in, follow us, like, and share. Um, our pages is on the link in the bio below. And remember to stay uncommon.